Welcome to the Political Philosophy Podcast. I'm Toby Buckle. Today's episode is the second part of a two-parter with Professor Greg Caruso on free will and punishment. If you want to get the context for this conversation, you're more than welcome to go back and check out the first part. Or if you don't care too much for context, or, you know, maybe just don't trust this show to deliver it to you and we wouldn't blame you, then please feel free to just jump in in for the second part, Containment and Deterrence. In the first part of this conversation, we talked about free will generally, and Greg outlined an approach to punishment where instead of seeing violent, dangerous criminals as bad people deserving of retribution, we view them in a similar way that we would view people who carry an infectious disease, that certain security measures might need to be taken, in spite of the fact that they're not blameworthy in any ultimate sense. So we start the conversation there, and then we move on to talking about deterrence. To what extent is it ever justifiable to treat someone badly in order to deter future people from committing the same crime. And we disagree slightly there, so I would be interested in audience reaction to, you know, who you think is getting it right there, or maybe you think neither of us are. And I'll make an open offer that if someone's listening to the podcast and has some good points, DM me on Twitter or Facebook, email me, and if there's a really coherent argument against what I'm saying, I'd love to have you on to talk about it, whether you're a professional philosopher or not. So I'll just throw that one out there. Um, apart from that, let's get straight to today's episode. If you enjoy these episodes and find them valuable, know that I love bringing to them to you and a lot of work goes into them. We suggest a donation of $2 per episode. That's really easy to set up on our Patreon page, and I prefer to do that instead of ads. I always hate it when I'm listening to a podcast I like, and it gets interrupted by a long spiel trying to sell you underwear. So we don't do that, but I'll put it this way. If you get the same enjoyment or more out of today's episode than you would from a cup of coffee, consider supporting it on a similar basis. Now, maybe where you live, a cup of coffee isn't $2. I live in New York, so $2 is actually a pretty cheap cup of coffee. But do the math, whatever a cup of coffee is to you. And if it's worth that, we would love to have it. If you like the show but aren't able to donate, sharing it on your own social media is also a great way of supporting it. So with that as preamble, it is my absolute pleasure to bring you for a second time, Professor Greg Caruso. Let me let me just go back to a couple more points I had about the um, prevention the, the prevention model yeah. is it strikes me that there's one big similarity and one dissimilarity um, between um, the idea of a contagion and the idea of uh, uh, preventing someone because they might be a murderer or something. The one similarity, and this is more of an intuition than an argument, is what I call the eyeball test of ethics, which is could you look someone in the eye? who is worst affected by this ethical rule and comfortably explain to them this is what needs to happen to them, right? Mm. So I saw, this is this seems like a lateral move, but I'm going to bring it back in. I saw this wonderful documentary where a brown-skinned Muslim woman goes and interviews neo-Nazis and white supremacists and sort of spends time with them and becomes their friends. And then she just asks them, so, you know, you want to kill N-words or deport them or whatever, 
would that apply to me, who you've been spending time with and you call your friend now? And the level of discomfort that they have is beautiful and amazing to watch. Because they have these intellectual and ethical commitments, but they can't bring themselves to say it to to the face of someone who they see as a human being. And that should just be an obvious flag that you've got something wrong ethically. Now... What I like about the quarantine model is if, say, you did, like in your example, contract an infectious disease and we detained you, and you said to me, this is completely unfair, I'm going to lose my job, this is like, I I don't like it. I feel I could completely comfortably look you in the eye and said, I hear all that and I'm really sorry for that, but people are going to die if we let you out. And that just, surely you have to see that that overrides it. And likewise, if you're one of these people who like... There seems to be just a class of people who rape a young girl, go to prison for a few years, get out, rape a young girl again, go to prison for a few years, and Mm. that is just the cycle of their life. I feel like I could look at that person and say, hey, you know, I," and they would say, I'm suffering so much in prison, and I'd I'd Mm. say, I understand, and I'm sorry for that. But at the end of the day, if we let you out, we have every expectation of you doing this again. And that just has to take priority. So, whereas you can't have that same thing with retribution. The difference, though, that I see is that there's a very clear case with the contagion model of where you could let someone out again, whereas it's just a crapshoot for criminal justice. We could do a blood test. Oh, doesn't have the disease anymore. Well, Greg, you're free to go. Sorry for the inconvenience. Right, right, right. So, right. So, whereas with criminal justice, you could have two people who are both saying, I'm completely rehabilitated, I'm never doing this again, but one of them is absolutely doing it again, and the other isn't, and you wouldn't. It'd be much harder to tell, right? No, right. So these are really important uh, practical questions, right? And I don't have answers for all of <laughs> for all of these concerns. I'm, I'm writing a book about this model right now, actually, where I hope to work through some of this in more detail. But... Um, I would say, you know, a couple of things. First, um, not all continued threats deem continued incapacitation, right? So let's say I'm a kleptomaniac or, you know, I steal compulsively or something and you, you, you know, um, I don't know if that reaches the threat level to warrant incapacitation in the first place. But even if we can't rehabilitate you, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that continued threat warrants continued incapacitation. Now, serial killers and child molesters, I think you're right, right? We want, we want to have a sort of more certain guarantee that they're not going to recidivate, right? Um, and there are concerns here. I tend to lean towards less restrictive than more restrictive approaches to this, right? So if you look at, say, um, Norwegian systems of criminal justice that are not free of retribution, but they moved more towards this model of rehabilitation and reintegration, um, the max sentence you could get in Norway is, I think, 21 years for anything. Um, and it stretched the, the, um, credulity of some Norwegians when they had that serial killer who shot all those kids at that um, uh, at that summer camp, I think it was. Um, and all they could give him was 21 years. Um, now, what they can do is add incrementally five-year increments after that, because what they have is mandatory reevaluations within the system. So most people in Norway, the, the average sentence is less than a year. Um, and, and most, the majority of, of people that are imprisoned don't serve more than, I think, four or five years. Um, and the max you could get is, say, 21 years, even for the worst heinous crimes. Um, what I would implement, and there's no perfect solution to this, what I would implement are more um, – interventions along the way, obviously a focus on rehabilitation, which we lack completely in our system now, um, and not just be driven by criminal justice advocates, but be driven by you know mental health professionals, uh, drug treatment professionals, um, where there's mandatory reevaluations um, along the way, right? So we could get better senses of, of, of the person's state of mind, future threat, uh, you know, um, level of rehabilitation. Um, I'm on the fence about certain types of things. So like, for example, I, I, I'm co-director of this um, network called the Justice Without Retribution Network. And we held a conference where we had an expert, um, um, Jennifer Chandler, come from Canada, where she works, um, she's a psychologist or uh, I think a technical 
position as a psychologist or, or um, it could be a forensic psychologist working with uh, people who are sex offenders in Canada. Um, and in Canada, they offer chemical castration as an option. And my first intuition is, oh, this is a horrible uh, option to, to offer someone. Um, now, I haven't looked at that much into it, and I don't know the rates of effectiveness. One of the things that it, it benefits is that it's, it's reversible. Um, so it's not a permanent, it does have side effects. But so I worry this, is little... where, this is where I just become the stereotype of what everyone fears utilitarians are, of just uh-huh. not caring about persons is uh-huh. cool. If it worked, if it worked. Right. What I worry a little bit about is the the forced consent component. Like if you know, I could I could hold you indefinitely, or you could accept this kind of you know procedure. How much is is true consent here present? But the, if these people consent to it, um, and later, and some of her work has shown that later they are satisfied with their decision. So five years out, and they haven't recidivated. For example, most many of them report that they lose their desire. Um, in some cases, you lose all your sexual desires, but um, they lose their desire for offending. Um, some people actually report that it, they believe it brings them deeper in line with their hierarchical self. So they had this lower desire to uh, sexually uh, or you know offend, but they had a higher order desire that disapproved of it. Right? They didn't approve of their sexual desire. Um, and that accepting this kind of treatment option allowed them to to put in line their higher order and lower order desires. Um, I'd be open to those uh, as options. I would need to look at them, and I'm going to look at them in more detail um, because there might be other ethical concerns that just override these um, uh, issues that I'm talking about at the moment. But um, if these were effective and these were uh, legitimate options that reduced incarceration, um, and they were effective in protecting public safety, and that they were voluntarily chosen, um, I begin to have less and less ethical concerns about them. So I, but so the, example, other, yeah. the other thing is that technology is just te- the rate of technological increase is exponential, and the technology is just going to get better and better and better. So, like, chemical castration is quite crude, but Sam Harris has this idea of what if you just had a pill that cured psychopathy? Yeah. Right. Like, how bizarre would it be if, if the worst, like, serial killer, you could just give them a pill that cured them? Do our, they still deserve it? Yeah. Our current moral intuitions yeah. would find it bizarre to just give them it. But then he says, yeah. what perversity would mean that you wouldn't cure someone of psychopathy if you could out of a desire to punish them. Yeah, yeah. Like, it, ultimately, it, the, the moral technology is going to get us to a pr- place where we've just got to break these moral intuitions. Because right. otherwise they're going to hold us back from being able to use things that are going to make everybody's life better. Right. And so this it reminds me of a tough case from my model, which uh, someone has risen as an objection, which is like the 90-year-old Nazi so let's say there's this Nazi um, who um, was not captured after World War II or brought to justice, um, and he fled to South America. He went to Argentina or somewhere. But since the war has ended, he's been a model citizen. He's been a good member of his community, hasn't um, engaged in any antisocial behavior. Um, um, so we have now, you know, 50 years of, of, of a, you know, behavioral baseline that he doesn't he hasn't you know imposed a threat to society and now we hunt him down and we locate him in his 90s um you know does this person need to be given their just desserts and you know i think a lot of people's intuitions is that something needs to be done but my model dictates you know that um if the person poses no future threat to society and then 90 years old um and you know 50 years of 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 good behavior indicates he probably has, you know, very low, if not, you know, zero, uh, um, rest poses zero rest of society. Um, do we punish him or do we imprison him? And I might just bite the bullet and say, no, I mean, I, 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 um, I, you know, there might be something that needs to be done in this case, um, to recognize the immoral nature of the act, um, and to, uh, compensate the victim. So um, maybe there needs to be a process um, of, uh, you're going to talk to Tamler Summers, uh, you said in your next podcast. So um, he he's a big fan of this uh, model. 
So maybe a process of restorative justice that engages in the the you know uh, descendants of the victims, um, and and you know this individual um, can be justified. But incapacitation on my model couldn't be justified. If you're a retributivist, you need, it doesn't matter. It, it it doesn't matter at all what the future uh, threat of this individual is. What you know, con- you know, what threat they pose to society. Um, it's all about backwards looking blame and retribution. I could think of a, a, a rationale for um, punishing the 90 year old Nazi that wouldn't involve retribution. Here's one thought I would have on the 90 year old Nazi is I said I thought they were three justifications for punishment, um, one of which is retribution, which I think we agree might make emotional sense, but doesn't make logical or societal sense. The other of which is um, um, harm prevention for that individual, which mm-hmm. could be modelled on... You, uh, quarantine is quite a good analogy. But the third would be deterrence, in a general yeah, sense. Right, right. And deterrence, I find, is the most problematic. Now, the empirical literature on deterrence is really, really mixed. You'll get yeah. some people saying, well, obviously there's a t- deterrence effect. People respond to incentives. Clearly, if everything was legal, we'd see more crime. And then you get some people saying, actually, it's more about social conditioning, and most criminals don't really do stuff in a truly voluntary sense anyway, and that actually there's no difference between, say, the death penalty or life in prison. But on a theoretical moral level, deterrence makes a mess of the whole moral theory. Because if there is a deterrence effect, then we, are, if we're going to be consequentialists, we have to start taking that into account. Now, that might have intuitive things, like there might be a case in terms of deterrence for some sort of punishment for the Nazi because it shows people who might be committing war crimes today. No, no, look, there is a thing such as international law. We, one day we will eventually catch up with you. So it's a net good on that count. But then it leads you to really unintuitive things, like if you could save future murderers by executing people or by collective punishment, then that would come onto the table too. So, yeah. Yeah, So let me jump in and say a couple of things. So first of all, your consequential forward-looking deterrence models are totally consistent with free will skepticism. They're not my desired justification, though, and I have some concerns about them, and I think— Maybe this is where my model has some advantages over the over these kind of uh, uh, consequential deterrence accounts. Um, my fear is that the justification of deterrence on consequentialist grounds runs into objections that are pretty familiar with that are you know presented against utilitarianism in general. Um, something like the use objection, which is that you could use individuals in certain ways if they were effectively to act as deterrence. So, like if there was a you know crime spree that was occurring, and that we if we just came down really harsh, even disproportionate punishment on just a few people, it might effectively deter. And if it were to be an effective deterrent, consequentialism would maybe perhaps justify it. Yet our intuition might be that that harsh treatment or excessively harsh treatment wasn't, you know, isn't justified to fight despite the fact that it's an effective deterrent. Just, just to come in quick here, I've yeah. actually got a whole podcast on this. Um, yeah. The second podcast with Cecile Farb, um, Execution, Torture and War, which is as lighthearted as it sounds. But then, then there's two levels to that, though. If what you're talking about is a disproportionately harsh response... Then, so th- there's a consequentialist ground for maintaining a universal rule of law. Right? That's true, right. So, so there might like, be ways so, you can so, get so, around. So, it. like, right. you, do you execute the innocent man to save or right. to prevent a riot that will kill 10 people? Well, no, because in practice, if you're going to start making decisions like that, if not in theory, in practice, that will lead to just a breakdown of the justice system, which we could argue would be bad overall for consequences. Right. And then non-consequentialists will say, oh, but what about if we construct this really weird specific scenario where no one right. would ever find out and it doesn't affect mm-hmm. general enforcement? To which my response is, you ask a really weird and stupid question, you get a really weird and stupid answer. Like, yes, yeah, in that case that will be justified, but that's... Yeah virtually never going to be the case in the real world. And even Mm. if it were, because of imperfect information, you'd never know that you were in that case. So Mm. the general rule applies. But that doesn't let you off the... Let me give you... you And you could say the same thing. You could say the same thing against uh, uh, 
you know, um, finding innocent people guilty of crimes if they were effectively deterrent, because you could argue that on a larger consequentialist calculation, that wouldn't be overall uh, beneficial. Yeah. Right. But that general thing, and again, I think most people come from the point of view of our moral intuitions are correct. Does the theory you're espousing get you there? I come from the point of view is, is the theory right? Right? So if there is a case for doing things that feel, making moves that feel weird in terms of punishment, that might just be the correct case. So just yeah. to be explicit about that, when we're talking about serial killers and serial rapists, that's the tiniest minority of people in prison. We're right. talking, like, like if what we're saying is serious, we're talking about a profoundly counterintuitive, like 90-something percent reduction in prisoners. Right. And I right. just say that if that's counterintuitive, too bad, it's correct. Yeah. But then yeah. that also goes for the deterrence side. So you mentioned Sweden, but the... Or Norway. Or, yeah, yeah, but the lowest murder rate of any developed, big developed country is Japan. And that's like, if Sweden's three times lower than the US, Japan's three times lower than Sweden. Now there, you can have a one, two year prison sentence for murder, but if you do it again, they'll execute you. And yeah. it seems to be effective. And if that is effective, now you could argue that's because of Japanese culture, not that particular, no, no, right, right. you know. But just say but I, that it was. If that was a model that got you the lowest murders, is the first time you murder someone is two years. The second time we kill you. Would that yeah, not... Yeah, so on my model, this is, yeah, right. So, yeah, good. A couple of things. So I'm not, you know, I, I thank you for the defense of the consequentialist model. I'm, I'm not saying if it succumbs to those kind of objections, I think there are responses that could be given. But on my model, um, no, the the Japanese, uh, you know, second time execution <laughs> approach would not be justified, even if it were an effective deterrent, because I don't view my account as essentially a consequentialist account. Um, it's forward-looking, but the justification is actually grounded in the right of self-defense um, and the protection of harm to others. So in this case, um, I actually like where my model comes down better than – so I, m my view is that these individuals don't justly deserve um, execution for the kind of crimes that you might you know, be alluding to. Uh, I don't think anyone deserves execution. Um, so – even if it were an effective deterrent, I would be opposed to it. And I think, and I think you, that's the right place to be. You seem to be bringing in some sort of deontology that, that, like you say, that's not a consequentialist worldview. Right. So I do have deontological components of my theory where I think I could, I think I can defend them on on certain grounds. Right. So, um, like, so I have a so in terms of my prevention and social justice component of my theory, the social justice theory that I favor here is a uh, capability approach, kind of like Nussbaum and Sen, um, where the goal of social justice is to um, to effectively allow for certain kinds of capabilities that lead to human well-being. And I identify sort of like six of them, health, reasoning, self-determination, attachment, personal security, and respect. Um, and but, but all of that just sounds like consequences to me. That all just sounds like desirable states of consciousness. Whereas to well, make no, to things like respect for me and um, these are these would override certain kinds of utilitarian or consequentialist concerns for me at least. So um, you couldn't you couldn't dehumanize someone in a in a uh, incapacitation situation on my model, even if it were effective in deterring other individuals. So why, were, why not? Um, because I don't think individuals deserve um, deserve punishment at all. So I, I prefer a a non punitive incapacitation account ground so you can quarantine me you can limit my liberty in the case with ebola but you can't justify dehumanization presumably you though presumably though i could create some sort of trolley problem where in which you would flip a switch to, for the greater good there, there, there must be some case where you would justify killing um well not you know killing in general i don't know you'd have to give me a case but um, sniper on the roof. Um, yeah. Yeah. If you, you, the police have a clean shot at him, if you don't take it, you can expect another ten people to die. All oh, right, right, but this could be grounded in the right of self-defense. Yeah, right. Um, but then, 
if just, and this isn't the case at all, but hypothetically, if executing a guilty person would deter, deter 10 future murders, wouldn't that become permissible, if not necessary? No, no, I, 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 I'd say no. Um, and, and it, it, but it seems like you're going to have to, to, to get that distinction, which is an intuitive distinction, you're going to have to introduce something that's going to feel a hell of a lot like free will. Uh-huh. No, because I think you could ground a certain accounts of justice um, in. So there are ju- there are there are accounts of justice that are desertist accounts based on concepts of desert, and there are non-desertist accounts of justice. Like Rawls's account is a non-desert based account of justice, and the capability approach is a non-desert based account of justice. And I think that if you if you prioritize i use the justice as the foundation of my public health framework not consequentialism and so i take that that as the foundation of the purpose of the public health approach is the promotion of social justice grounded in the pursuit of developing certain functions and capabilities that are necessary for human well-being can be defended without appealing to uh free will or desert um now you're right. That's a challenge. You got to. Th- th- there's got to be a lot of theoretical work that cashes that out in a way. Um, and maybe you're right that at some point in that defense, I appeal to something I'm not entitled to appeal to. But at the moment, I don't see why I have to appeal to to something um, that brings free will or desert back in. No, it's it's more a question of like epistemological weight yeah. in that should we be completely confident. That there's no that there's no such thing as originalist free will. No, I mean, given how many people believe in it, and given just our general like own fallibility, oh, we, we, need, we need to give it some sort of credence, right? But I would argue, in terms of like how we um, um, justify social policies, the credence that we have that we know we have conscious experience because we have it. I think, therefore, I am, and we know that we have different and more and less desirable consequences. That, that the epistemological foundation of that is just so much stronger than the epistemological foundation of free will that even if we're giving free will some sort of credence, I think a concern for consequences, broadly understood, yeah. is always going to override it. And I sort of feel a similar way about deontology. I'm not saying that there aren't deont side constraints, and I'm certainly not saying that my credence in them is zero. I'm saying given just how overwhelmingly epistemologically confident that we can be, that there exist such things as happiness and suffering, if you're going to bring something else into the theory, you have to cash it out with an epistemological confidence that at least gets it into the same ballpark. Mm -hmm. Right, so let me use like a real example um, of aging populations in prison, for example, right? So there's this huge population of people hitting their 70s and 80s um, who have no chance of release. And um, according to retributive proportional punishment, they're, they're maybe lifers, they have life sentences, so they're going to die, you know, in prison. Um, but on certain on certain um, data points that I've looked at, recidivism rates after a certain age um, decline almost down to zero. And when you get to the certain age, like 70s and 80s, recidivism rates, uh, the chance of this person recidivating, it goes way down. Now, of course, there are other social pressures. Like if you release individuals who are elderly populations and there's no housing available, or there's social stigmatization, or they can't um, you know, get work, um, they might have resort to petty crime or something. But assuming we address the social context that would allow for these people to be released, right? Uh, my model would say, um, if they pose no future threat to society, they have to be released. My concern with the, even a consequential deterrence model is that there might be, there might be, I don't know, maybe you're going to give a counter story, but there might be a story that could be said that, well, look, it might effectively deter individuals to have um, a kind of, you know, a model looks very much like retributive proportionality, right? Where as a general rule, we have certain sentences for certain crimes because this on the long run will work effectively to deter individuals from committing murders. And that might mean that certain 70 and 80 year old people who pose no threat to society should be continued to be incapacitated. Um, and that's where I think me, my, my intuition and your intuition are going to split. You're going to let. I, I, I think, don't know that it's an intuition, though. I feel like it's just an empirical question that has an answer. 
answer, and it's a very complicated empirical question, but our, our intuitions are just um, what the answer is. So is the total amount of suffering of keeping people in, say, once they're past 70, um, is that outweighed by the amount of suffering that could be deterred by so doing? Actually, my intuition would be in that case, the deterrence effect wouldn't be enough to justify that additional suffering. See, now, but but there, is, my, there is just an answer to that question, yeah, though. We, are, we both are bottoming out empirical questions, but they're different questions. Yours is this overall calculation, which is an empirical question. Mine would be whether the individual poses any future threat, and that's the empirical question. If you answer no, that overall consequential calculation um, wouldn't factor into my theory. So, oh, oh, but, but so what? So, so on my theory, it's like on my theory, if this in, on an individual basis, if that individual, individual X poses no future threat and he's a certain age, I say release him, even if it runs contrary to your empirical question, which would be on the overall balance of things, maybe it would be better, let's just say hypothetically the empirical question came in favor of holding him. I would say you have to release him. You would say you're justified in continuing to hold him. Okay, so let's dig in here because this is interesting. Yeah. We yeah. have a hypothetical individual who's yeah. 70, who's killed 20 people, but we know is not going to kill again. Say he's in a wheelchair, an asthmatic, and he's like, dis you know, like they just, they, they, we right. know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's know, physically capable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We know <laughs> that he's not, you know, doing anything. And then I say, but. We also know, and I don't know, and this is where it breaks down, and I think where the intuition the other way comes, is I have no idea how we could gain this knowledge, but just say yeah, that yeah. we could. Yeah. I know for a fact that one future murder, which I count as a greater moral weight than the rest of his life, one future murder will be deterred if we release him because of debt deterrence effects. You would say still release him. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to ramp it up. Ten future murders. <laughs> um, right, because I, yeah, uh, because I don't think you could hold this individual accountable for the actions of others, or I don't think you could exert punishment on this individual for the actions of others. So I put a heavier weight on liberty, I think, than you do in this case. Ten thousand future murders. I think I'm going to stick to it. <laughs> the death of all conscious life, including the individual himself. Well, look, I mean, at, the, at a certain point. I think, you know, it comes to a question of, like, do I think it's deserved or justified? I'm going to continue to say no, no matter how many people. If you ask me whether we should override that moral constraint uh, in these extreme cases, you know, I might succumb to that, but I might say that it doesn't justify it. Cecile Farb gave me the exact same answer yeah, when I yeah. pushed her on that. Um, yeah, yeah. But this is where this is, I'm just going to sound terribly rude because I, I can. It's my podcast. Um, but it, when you get into these scenarios, it sort of feels like there aren't really deontologists. There's just consequentialists in various states of confusion. We yeah. all agree that there's side constraints. We all agree that there's rules of justice and liberty we want to follow. Again, for the sort of kill an innocent man to save ten reasons, because overall it's better. But then right. there comes a point where you make the example so ridiculous where for any person, just an innate consequentialist well, just true. kicks yeah. in again, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And so we, it, it seems to me but like you can get to all of that just through consequentialism, just through, like, we want to observe rules for the sake of observing rules. But yeah. then there does come a point where everyone just throws up their hands and goes, fine. Like, I think one of my foundational ethical commitments would be, I think, torture needs to be prohibited. But yeah. to stop a nuclear war? Maybe. You know? Yeah. No, no, I, I mean, I, I, I get the intuition. Um, I'm just saying that I'm grounding my theory in, in, in something other than deterrence, so we do have these differences, I think, you know, in cases like, <laughs> in cases like yeah. this. I mean, I think deterrence as a matter of practicality shouldn't be primary, right? Because I think right. the empirical well, evidence is so mixed. Because I think my account could get deterrence on the cheap, if you will, hmm. which is um, which is that it's not the justificatory force that is accounting for the incapacitation. But I would argue that, you know, by just limiting one's liberty, you buy a secondary property, get some deterrence, I think. Um, 
But I, I, I don't see how, at least on my approach, um, you could take deterrence as the as the primary justification. Um, and, and so for that, I think I get up in slightly different places in certain cases um, than than consequentialist approaches with this public health quarantine model. Because, and you know, whether or not they could overcome the objections in the ways that you were saying earlier, um, I would be, you know, totally okay with saying that they do. But if they, I still have slight worries of the use objections, concerns about innocence, such that maybe deterrence could override them in cases that I wouldn't want to override. Yeah, I mean, there's an interesting question that we could perhaps close with, which is something like, with the use of innocence, what's an acceptable false positive rate in the criminal justice system? Because we say innocent till proven guilty, but are you talking... 100% credence, that seems like you'd never convict anybody. But then as soon as you start to put a number on it, people get really uncomfortable. I talked to someone who who worked with prisoners, and I said, what what percentage do you think are innocent? And he said, it's it's the the majority did it, right? But he said, if I had to guess, I'd say for people serving life, it's maybe like 10, 15% didn't. But if you think of the number of people that is, that's terrifying. But then, if, if by reducing our prison population, you know, our, our, if we reduce that down to 2%, say, you'd still have a lot of innocent people going to prison, but then also, but you'd have less, but then also you'd get less convictions, so presumably deterrence would be a lot lower. How would you begin to tackle that question of what is an acceptable margin of error for conviction? Well, I, I think the, all the, so, so, for me, if you were to look at the actual way a trial might be conducted, the guilt or innocence phases. So, for example, state of mind is an important mens rea in criminal law is an important condition. You know, um, what I would say is that all those compatibilist things we talked about earlier, voluntariness, reasons, responsiveness, compulsion are all important, but they're important at a different place. So what I would say is the finding of fact stage should be whether the agent is causally responsible, right? So like, did you pull the trigger? Did you drive the car into the individual, et cetera, right? Um, So that's where innocence matters for me, because on my account, the right of self-defense doesn't justify harming anyone other than the individual that poses the threat. And so I want to have like a zero tolerance level for 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 incapacitating people who are not causally responsible. But beyond that, I would say you want to consider things like state of mind, not because of assessing guilt, but for assessing future risk. So if I intentionally drove the car into the crowd, that that indicates I have a kind of um, you know disposition or character that might pose a future threat in actions in the future. If I had a seizure and I drove the car into the crowd and killed individuals because of, um, you know, something completely outside my control, like, you know, an involuntary seizure, um, that might take your license away, but I don't think incapacitation is justified. How would you... So so innocence, innocence matters in terms of causal responsibility for me, but... In terms of guilt, it doesn't – I don't have, I have a guilt-free sort of model. It's not for the judgment of guilt. It's for the assessment of future risk the individual so poses. So your ideal criminal justice system would be much, much, much more cautious about sentencing someone just on the pure factual basis of did you do it. You wouldn't go with, like, reasonable doubt. You'd go with, like, no, we're, we're like, basically certain. Well, I mean, reasonable doubt is a, is a, is a you know, is a plausible standard. I, I think – Maybe we want to hold on the reasonable doubt, but I do think I would side on the side of liberty over safety. I would rather take the risk of letting an individual do harm than preemptively taking away someone's liberty. Um, So I I want to weigh heavily, maybe more heavily than some consequentialists liberty here. And partly for reasons you said earlier, which is we're not in a good epistemic position generally. To know, to know, you know, like even even in the future, brave new world where we have these computer models that judge, you know, how how large my amygdala is, and and you know, social factors about my upbringing and socioeconomic status. Um, look, you might have all these various risk factors. Think of it like a combination lock, where there's 20 numbers dials on the on the lock. Even if I have 19 of those dials in place, 
right? Mm. The lock still doesn't open. So I might have all these social determinants that put me at a very high risk of committing crime, but it's not until that last dial is, you know, uh, dialed in correctly that the lock would unopen. I would rather preserve liberty because I don't think we're in a good epistemic position to start preemptively incapacitating individuals so let's because we have a high yeah. probability that they're going to do harm in the future. What I would use the high pro- the modeling, the computer big data in the future, computer modeling to do is to use that to more effectively address the prevention and social justice components, right? right. So we even things like we might police certain neighborhoods on warmer days because we know crime rates go up as the temperature rises, right? We might use them Although for that sort of big uh, data. We might use has preemptive. famously run into problems of it can lead to racial discrimination. No, right. right. There are those concerns. But I would say we shouldn't use those those techniques of profiling for preventive incapacitation because I would much rather favor innocence and liberty in cases like this than than taking the risk for public health on the other, or public safety. I want to lock in this one final question, and I'm just going to pull my thoughts together because it's a complicated question, but mm. it, it, it seems like we're converging on what we'd actually want to see in the world, but mm. for different reasons, and I kind of want to just dig that out. So we're, we're converging that the main justification for... Um, incapacitating someone is just in terms of harm prevention, the quarantine model, right? And we're agreeing that deterrence might have some role, but it's, it's, a, it's definitely way down the line, right? Now, yeah. my justification for that would be epistemic confidence and credence. So yeah. I would say, if you've got someone, if you've captured Ted Bundy, right, we yeah. can be very, very, very confident that he was killing and cannibalizing young yeah. men. Right, And we can also be, not 100% certain, but reasonably confident that this is someone who is um, not going to have good consequences if we allow them to continue to do that, right? right. right. Our, our, and so our credence for that should be very, very high. Now, by incapacitating him, are we, is there an additional effect of deterring future murders well, our epistemic confidence for that is much, much lower, right? It might yeah. be, but maybe your Ted Bundys of the world, they're just neurologies they're wrong, and, 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 they're, and they're going to do no. weird things anyway. But yeah, that's right. an empirical question which is going to involve like a million variables that we don't have the answers to. So, so maybe cr- not in, then, then maybe not involve that. Well, as- exactly. So what I would say is given... I mean, it's, it's very analogous to the free will debate. My, my credence that free originalism is true isn't zero, but yeah. it's not high enough I'm really making decisions on that basis. Yeah. Yeah. So my credence that um, incapacitation in a sort of um, quarantine model can affect consequences is just so much higher than my credence in um, deterrence being true that perhaps it's always going to overwhelm it. But that, But that... Is for me, that in principle could change if our empirical understanding of the world changed. You want to seem to be making a bit of a thicker claim yeah. that <laughs> that even if, say, there was one special case where actually we had really good empirical reasons to believe in deterrence, you'd yeah. still have a reluctance to do so, right? Right. But I'll take what I can get. So I like I like the first part of that answer. <laughs> um, in, in which case, it seems like we end up in pretty similar places in practice. But in theory, I'm just wondering right, what, in these what you're bringing into the... In these hypothetical, probably non-realistic cases where we have knowledge we don't have, yeah, I think our intuitions will come apart a little bit. Let's end with a positive then. Um, <laughs> what, if we, what do we want to see in the world? What do we want to see in terms of criminal justice? Because I, I take it we would both want to see some radical change in, say, American prisons and how yeah, they operate. I, and I think we both would like to see uh, a move toward non-retributive approaches, um, a move toward rehabilitation, reintegration as a goal. I would like to see more funding and focus on the social determinants of poor health and, and criminal behavior. Um and so I think social policy um, would weigh differently. Um, 
if we took this kind of framework, because I think we would recognize that we have some kind of a moral obligation to address some of the social inequalities, racism, sexism, economic inequality, um, systematic disadvantage and disenfranchisement in certain communities, because they're drivers of, of criminal behavior and poor health. Um, um, now, it's really, really hard, though, to get over that hurdle and move people to to effectively get behind that mission if they are holding on to the intuitions of retribution this, and individual, individual s- blame. Isn't such and a case of where philosophy matters and like matters political philosophy matters? Because what, what's holding us back isn't a practical impediment. We could release half of the people in prisons tomorrow, right? Yeah. What's holding us back it, is a misunderstanding about the way reality works. Yeah. People think they're the ultimate causes of their actions, and there's yeah. just no particularly good reason to feel that way, right? Like, this is so where philosophy matters. Yeah, and this is why I, I really do think that um, real reform is going to need to look at some of the philosophical roots of our of our accounts more than just surface reform. I mean, I think you're going to find a lot of people moving towards surface reform. And you've seen a movement from the left and the right um, in an agreement that we need to do something about mass incarceration, but for drastically different reasons. Conservatives and libertarians are worried about cost and 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 what the effects are on the state level and things like that. Liberals are concerned with certain things about justice and fairness here. Um, but I, I, I think that you you can't have real criminal justice reform without a real look at this question of of individual um you know free will and, and responsibility and and matters of luck i mean we just have to realize that um a good deal of who i am and how i turn out have to do with factors that are just completely beyond my control that are just matters of luck i i just am lucky to have been been born white and male and middle class and so um, I've ended up to be lucky to be here talking about philosophy and have a PhD and teach college. I don't think I deserve praise for any of those achievements, just like I don't think I deserve blame if I ended up in a, a war-torn region of the world and found myself in a position where I was forced to commit murder to survive. Once you recognize this kind of causal chain, um, we could better address criminal behavior by effectively addressing the causes. And I think that we got to get past the barrier of, of you know, um, individual responsibility um, before we can really do that, because I think it's a barrier for looking for deeper causes. By, look, by focusing on individual responsibility, it sort of allows us to stop looking at that point. We just need to look at the individual. Um, and even the criminal justice system, we might have to look at a certain time slice of the individual. What was their state of mind at the time of the crime? And then you stop looking. You don't look at how they got to that state of mind, um, the conditions that drove them that developed that kind of you know characteristic, that kind of personality, that kind of set of wants and desires and, and psychological predispositions. Um, and I think we, the, you, once we get rid of retributivism and once we get rid of the notion of just desserts, we can look more deeply into the causes and more deeply into the systems that shape individuals. Cool. If people want to follow you or see more of your work, where should they go? Um, you can follow me on Twitter um, at, at uh, Greg D. Caruso. Um, or you could um, look me up on my websites, which are www.gregcaruso.com and www.justicewithoutretribution.com. Cool. Well, that was a really good, long, sustained conversation. Thank you so much for your time, Greg. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Political Philosophy Podcast. As mentioned a couple of times in this podcast series, I have an upcoming series with Tamla Summers of the Very Bad Wizards podcast, where some of these questions of meta-ethics that we've been moving around and discussing in this series, we really try and get to bedrock of where consequentialists and non-consequentialists are disagreeing. And that was a really valuable conversation for me. We disagreed a lot, 
but I think you'll get a lot out of it, or at least I hope you will. Before then, though, next week, I will be joined by Professor Theresa Bejan of Oxford University. And what I'm trying to do with this series, roughly, is alternate back and forth between, like, ethics and political philosophy and history of political thought. So next week will be a history of political thought where we're going to be talking about the impact of religion, religious toleration or intoleration in the early American colonies. That was a really valuable conversation, really fun and engaging conversation as well. So please do come back and join us for that. As always, you can follow us on our Facebook or Twitter page, and you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, on RSS feed, on SoundCloud, and on YouTube. So if you like this sort of content, there's all sorts of different ways to follow, and I encourage you to do so. The more followers we build up, then the easier it is for us to attract really cool guests to come on. Once again, if you want to support the show in a more sustained way, you can sponsor us at two bucks an episode. Super easy to do. Really, really valuable for us. And also just sharing. You know, our last episode, the first one with Greg, got a whole bunch of shares on our social media. That's really, 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 really awesome. Big thank you to everyone who did that. And yeah, apart from that, Thank you for listening to the show. It always amazes me that we now have hundreds, thousands actually, of people who tune in regularly every Saturday or every Monday. It appears that a lot of people have a day of the week that they listen to this. And uh, following this, it's been incredible. So thank you so much, genuinely, for your kind listening, your shares, sponsorship, anything like that. I'm really grateful. Until next week.